All right, so this is the third session for Creation, Evolution, Science, and the Church. So thanks to everyone for coming out. We have a nice uh, Indian summer kind of evening, so I figure we have pretty good attendance. These things do tend to go with the weather a little bit, which I don't blame anybody. I don't want to be here on a rainy night either. Um, so this is session number three. This is the one we've been building up to. Um, the last two sessions were necessary groundwork. Not the most interesting things in the world, but they were necessary so that we could talk about this stuff tonight, which is really current events, which is a lot more fun. Before we go on, does anybody know what that image that I have up here is? Had it up all three weeks. Yeah, Michelangelo is the creation of Adam from the roof of the Sistine Chapel. And the reason that I chose that, it is the classic image. This is a small part of that big image of God the touching of God's finger to Adam's finger. It's easier not to show all of Adam because Adam's very buff and very nude, so it's easier just not to bother with that. So the, uh, but this is this image. It's the last couple of times we've been focusing on the compatibility of the church with scientifically derived knowledge. What we need to focus on this time a little bit more is proper theological understanding of that knowledge. And so our proper theological understanding of the creation of the world, all the life on it, and people, the primary knowledge that we have there is this. Now, we had to go through all of our background to talk about our relationship to science, but our primary understanding is this, the theological understanding that God is the cause of everything. We're going to be talking about that a lot tonight. So, session three. Is it natural selection or intelligent design and the theological issues in human evolution? We talked about that a little bit in the Q&A after the last lecture, but we'll do it a little more this time. We have to get it onto film so that we cover it for everybody who might want to watch this course on YouTube. And we also need to go through some of those things now with the proper notes and the slides. It'll be better. Um, this image of the mousetrap is a really common, useful image that comes from this debate between natural selection and intelligent design as the alternative explanations which have currency in American culture for the mechanisms of evolution. The mousetrap is a very, very famous device in this, and we're going to talk about the mousetrap tonight. Um, I had to have a real high-res picture of a mousetrap. We're going to refer to it a little bit later. First, we have to recap. Catholics believe in laws of nature. This understanding purifies religion from superstition. We talked about that. We talked about the weather. We keep having weather disasters every week of this course. So we, this week it was tornadoes in Illinois, which were tragic. I could not help but notice that when the people who were affected by a weather disaster last week were in the Philippines and they spoke a different language than most Americans and looked different than most Americans. It was really easy to find opinions on the internet about how God must be smiting them. But this week, when the people affected by weather were God-fearing Christians from middle America, there wasn't a peep about God smiting anybody. All right? I could say maybe everyone's learning, but I don't think so. Anyway, this is the type of superstition that our religion should be purified from, needs to be purified from, and science assists us in that. Repeatable laws of nature are the basis of science. Science is the study of nature, not the supernatural, since only nature is predictable. We as Catholics, of course, believe the supernatural is not only real, it's the most real thing. However, it's not scientifically testable because it's not a naturally predictable and repeating process. This is an important point. It makes sense to everybody. The relationship of the church to science is one of independence and caution. The church lets scientists do science, and the church, as we've shown over the course of history of the church, once science became a real ongoing human endeavor, the church has endeavored to have the right relationship which lets scientists be scientists, lets scientists do science, and where the church is able to conform to scientific discoveries so long as they're presented properly, done properly, and, this is the big point, so long as they're not contradictory of Catholic dogma. Now, like I said, tonight we're going to talk about the proper theological understanding of these topics, so we have to now bring out dogma. The popes have led us into an acceptance of modern scientific knowledge and taught us there is no conflict between faith and reason. So. This is an important point. One of the points we brought out last week is that our, the popes, particularly Pope John Paul, 
was very eloquent in speaking about science, and Pope John Paul was very <laughs> trusting of the scientific endeavor. He had great faith in the ability of the scientific endeavor, given time to operate, to produce truth. He didn't have any problem with that. The popes don't have any problem with that. Common descent is a well-established fact. All life is related and has a common ancestor. Scientifically speaking, if we as a species understand anything about life on Earth, we understand this. This is very, very basic science. This is half of what Darwin's initial contribution was. Darwin's theory of evolution, roughly half of it concerns common descent, that everything is related. Tonight we're going to talk about the other half, which is the more fun half, the more controversial half. What we're going to do, we're going to investigate natural explanations for variation and selection, we're going to investigate criticisms of these natural explanations. We're going to explain different theistic explanations. We're going to investigate criticisms of intelligent design. And we're going to study the encyclical Humanae Generis, which is of Pius XII. We talked about it a little bit last time. And discuss problems between common descent and Catholic theology. What we're not going to do. We're not going to debate intelligent design versus evolution in this room. Notice I changed this. I changed this from creation to intelligent design because now we're talking about intelligent design this week. We're not going to debate that either. That's another one of those debates that's available 24-7, 365 on the Internet. If you want to go debate one side of this with someone, there are millions of people ready to yell at you at any point in time. I've been there. I've done it. I've had my fill of it. If you wish to go have this debate, go for it. We're not going to brand anyone a heretic over this topic because only at the very end of this we will brush up against dogmatic statements in the barest possible way. And we're going to talk about those a little bit, but it would be really difficult for anyone to actually be a heretic on this topic, particularly since none of us are bishops primarily and we're not teaching the people in vast numbers. We're just discussing this as little Catholic lay people. So we really don't have the opportunity to be pernicious, publicly manifest heretics on this. We'll still be careful, but... So, what we're talking about first off tonight is we're talking about this second half of Darwinian theory. The second half of Darwinian theory concerns the how. Common descent, we talked about last time, concerns the what. What happened? Well, all life on Earth apparently came from a common ancestor over a long period of time. That's the what. And now we get to the how. And this is where it gets controversial. Darwin's answer to the how concerned modification and selection. This is mostly common sense. So let's discuss it from a common sense perspective. Darwin, like all of us, like people before Darwin, knew about breeding. He knew about agriculture. He knew about horticulture. And he knew about the principle of breeding animals. And so he knew that there were variations between members of a species. We're a species. If you look around the room, there's a lot of variation in us. If you take an example that's very obvious and well known to all of us, like say dogs, we know that you can modify a dog over generations to become something very different than what you started with. All the breeds of dogs that we know all have a common ancestor, a wolf-like animal that was domesticated thousands and thousands of years ago. And so when you look at dogs and you see the variation in all different breeds of dogs, it's very easy to look at a Chihuahua and imagine a Chihuahua and think about a Great Dane or a Newfoundland, something like that, and you say, that's a powerful process. A lot of variation can be created through selection by taking the smallest puppy from a litter and putting it into a pool with other smallest puppies from litters and doing this again over generations and generations and generations, mankind can, by artificial selection, can create an extremely small breed of dogs. Now, this process is essentially what goes on in nature as well. And Darwin says, if we as human, human beings can artificially do this, could there be a mechanism in nature which is doing something parallel? It's common sense. We can think for a second. We as Texans, a lot of us will immediately think of hunting because hunting is something that we all, it's all around us all the time in Texas. And 
if you think about hunting, if you talk to hunters, they say, I saw a big one. It was a massive 12 pointer. And you say, why didn't you shoot him? He said, because he was only three years old and I was afraid he hadn't bred yet. I afraid he hadn't bred and he hadn't gotten his genetics. Hunters understand this really, really easily because they want the very best animals and they recognize that hunting is a selection. It's an artificial selection, but it's a selection pressure, just like breeding. This is something that farmers and ranchers and people like that have understood for thousands and thousands of years. This is commonsensical. So, this is the best known example of selection. When someone starts talking about evolution, teaching evolution, this is the example that's always brought up because it's really obvious. Okay, so this is the peppered moth. There are two, this is, you find the peppered moths in England, you find them in Europe. We're going to talk about peppered moths in England. There are two varieties there. There is the typical peppered moth, which is white, looks like it has pepper on it. And then you have the black variety, the dark variety. And both of these are naturally occurring varieties of peppered moths. But the white variety of moth was more common until, until the Industrial Revolution, when coal began to be burned in large quantities. In England, they burned a tremendous amount of coal. And the soot from the smokestacks on the factories and the mills would darken the bark and the limbs of the trees in the area. And what happened to the moths in the areas around the coal-fired mills and factories? Well, the white moths now became the most visible moths. The dark moths, which had previously been at a disadvantage, became the best camouflage moths. Among the very first experiments done concerning evolution and natural selection were simple experiments done with nets. Put up a net in a forest around a bunch of trees, have birds in the net, catch a bunch of these moths, count the moths, release them into the net, close the net for a few days, let the birds and the moths have at it. At the end of that time, open the net, catch the moths, count the moths. It was very easy to determine that in an area where soot was darkening the trees, the birds were eating the white moths because they were easier to see. And in an area where there was no soot, the birds were eating the black moths because the black moths were easier to see. The darkening of the trees was not something nature did, but the birds are certainly natural. This was a, because this was something that people could see happening, it was an environmental change that was easily observable. This was the first time that anybody said, can we see this type of selection happening in nature? And the answer was yes. So this is the most basic and most well-known example of this. Now, classic natural selection is something like the herds on the African plains. The idea that predators and prey are in competition. And we all know, if you've ever had National Geographic TV on, or you've ever had the Discovery Channel on, among all the wildebeest, which wildebeest will be caught by the lions? The sick one, the slow one, the weak one. Darwin saw this, and in a commonsensical way, he said, if breeding has the ability to change the breed, which we know that it does through our own breeding that we do, he said then selection pressure must also have the ability to change the breed. This is a very commonsensical observation, but it was a powerful one. All of these ideas have to, at some point in human history, they have to be articulated in a way that they can be explained to others and they can be criticized. And that's what Darwin did with this. He was the person who articulated it to humanity. Another good example of selection that we all can see watching, this is a headline from this week. This is online news this week. Superbugs could erase a century of medical advances. This is about bacteria and antibiotics. So we can observe really rapid natural selection. We can observe it really easily in bacteria. Why? Because there are a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of bacteria in your body right now, as disgusting as that is. There's a lot of bacteria, and they reproduce really, really rapidly. So changes in the bacterial population are easy to see because they happen really rapidly to a large number of bacteria. I like these numbers. The number of bacteria on Earth, that's five followed by 30 zeros compared to the number of people on Earth. The number of bacteria living in human bodies around the world right now is six followed by 23 zeros. How does that make you feel? It doesn't make me feel great. But...
The numbers of bacteria in an infected human body are truly large numbers. Um, from a book I was reading lately, just an anecdotal uh, piece of information, in a person suffering from a bacterial illness, the number of bacteria living in that body at the height of the disease is typically larger than the mammals that have lived on the earth ever. That's the kind of relative numbers we're talking about. So if you're going to observe evolution in a population, bacteria are a really good place to observe it. So how are we causing bacteria to evolve? All right, this is, if you've never been through this, it's pretty interesting. So when the doctor prescribes you a course of antibiotics for a bacterial illness, the course of antibiotics is formulated and the doctor gives it to you on their best judgment that this is a course of antibiotics which is expected to kill off all, a vast, vast majority of the infectious bacteria in your body. And then what do we typically do with this package of antibiotics? Do we take the entire course and thereby kill the vast numbers? No. Nope, we all have a bad habit. We take it and we start to feel better. And then we say, gosh, these things were expensive and they were hard to get. I think I'll save them for next time. And we take the half-used package and put it in the medicine cabinet. And we haven't actually killed off enough of the bacteria to defeat the disease. And the bacteria come raging back. But which bacteria come raging back? The ones that survived. The ones that were the strongest. The ones that were least susceptible to the antibiotic. You have performed natural selection on the bacterial colony in your own body. And now you have superbugs within you. And now what will you do? You'll probably infect somebody else. And what will they do? Now they have version 2 of the bacteria. This colony is now stronger, more resistant to, uh, to the antibiotics. And now the doctor will prescribe them with antibiotics. And it'll knock it back. And then what will they do? They'll say, gosh, these things were expensive and hard to get. And they'll put the half-use package up. And now if they get a relapse, that's now version 2 superbugs. This process repeated many times. Natural selection selects for those bacteria that are most resistant to the antibiotics until now it's no longer just a, a rare variation. Now that's all that there are. There are only resistant, and that's what the scare over superbugs is. The idea that this process is happening, nothing's being done to stem this process. So. If we want to say, does natural selection work? Yeah, it obviously works. Natural selection works. It's a process we can observe. We can observe it happening all over the world right now. But if you remember, last week we talked about speciation, where species come from. And when we're going to find evidence of speciation and examples we can observe, the examples that we're able to show are not examples of speciation by natural selection. They're examples of speciation for other reasons. Remember we talked about the, the meadowlark, that pretty little yellow bird, and how it was speciated by what? A geographical boundary. And over time, these two isolated populations of birds started to sing different songs. And now, even though they overlap, they don't recognize each other. There's no competition involved there. So it's important to realize that by the way, I had to put Animal Olympics in here because it's just too cool. That's from my youth. It's important to realize that Darwin was not saying that competition between animals is the only force that causes change. Darwin anticipated, remember we talked about how he spent 20 years working on this, refining this theory. One of the things that he did was he anticipated so many objections. that Darwin anticipated, and, it in, and in the origin he says, this competition, this struggle for existence is not the only source of selection. That there are other sources of selection. He makes the point that this is one of them, but it's not the only one. So I want to make the point that not everything is explained by the Animal Olympics. The second thing I want to point out about misunderstandings of this is some people gain a sort of a comic book understanding of what Darwin was saying. And of course, the best place to find a comic book understanding is in comic books. So we're not talking about changes that are happening because an organism wants them to or needs them to. Um, in the X-Men comic books, of course, if somebody is going to go underwater, they suddenly develop gills, right? Because they need them. 
This is an you find this misunderstanding of how modification and selection work. You find it everywhere. You find people start to use language when they're trying to explain Darwinian theory, which is natural. You'll find they'll use this language of will and volition. Oh, the species needed this, or the species wanted this, or in order to be better, the species did this. No, no, we're just talking about variations, just like with dog breeds. The dog does not want to become a Chihuahua but an outside force puts the smallest puppies together to breed. In the same way, we're not talking about a moth that wants anything. We're not talking about a moth that wills anything. We're just talking about a moth that is and a bird that is and how they interact, completely natural forces. So, does this leave us with any issues? Yes, this leaves many issues. If selection can differentiate between different animals. And if selection can choose an animal between the two, if the lion, as a selection force, can choose between two wildebeest because one is slower and more readily falls into the lion's jaws, where do the different traits that are being selected among come from? Why do new traits appear quickly in the geologic record? This bears some explaining. One of the hottest topics in evolutionary theory today is the fact that when Darwin proposed this, Darwin said, the world's very old and this is necessary. The theory wouldn't work if the world wasn't very old because these are slow processes. If you're thinking about these selection pressures, those wildebeest have been running across the plains of Africa for hundreds of thousands of years. The lions have been chasing them for hundreds of thousands and millions of years. This has been going on for a long time. Any changes that are occurring here are changing very, very slowly. Very slowly. The meadowlarks have a different song. 20,000 years, 15,000 years after the last ice age that could have divided their range into east and west. They now have a different song. They still look identical. They're speciated now. They're no longer interbreeding. Logic says they will diverge. They'll become more and more different over time. But after 15,000 years, they only have a different song. These changes that are occurring typically occur very, very slowly unless something artificial happens like the soot. Now, nature can make rapid changes. Volcanoes can do this. Volcanoes can darken things. But typically, these changes happen very, very slowly, unless we're talking about bacteria that reproduce every 20 minutes, and there's billions of them. So why do new traits appear quickly in the fossil record? This is another issue with natural selection. And then thirdly, why are most species unchanged for long periods, and some species are unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. How does natural selection explain this? Is it compatible? So we'll first talk, out of these three, we're first going to talk about the emergence of new traits. Because if you're going to have something to select from, if you're going to have organisms with different traits, and you're going to select for this one trait, and eventually the selection pressure over a period of time is going to actually end with something new, a new species, then you have to have a trait to select from, right? So if you go to all of these wildebeests out here, they're being selected. Right now, because the sun's up in Africa right now, wildebeests are being selected. It's happening. But what are they being selected for? Well, they're being selected to be the best wildebeest. The lions are eating the poor little sick ones, right? And what's left behind? Wildebeest. What will be left behind tomorrow? Wildebeest. <laughs> a thousand years from now, what will be left behind? Wildebeest. We can see logical paths to speciation in some areas. The birds we talked about, Darwin's finches, but we can't always see these paths to speciation. Instead, what we see paths to is we see paths to unchangingness and stasis. So, where do the new traits come from if they're going to be selected? All right. This was one of the very first problems raised against Darwinian theory. People said, well, I'm looking at things, and things tend to be the same as they always are. You remember the initial first uh, 
problem raised was, I've never seen a dog give birth to anything but a dog, and I've never seen a cat give birth to anything but a cat. And these people were imagining something sort of like an X-Man, you know, where a dog will give birth to something of different species. Darwin said, no, no, you don't understand. This is happening a lot more slowly than that. But the emergence of new traits is still an initial problem raised against Darwin. So, have we made any progress on this? Yes, a tremendous amount of progress has been made. Where new traits come from is a really, really interesting topic. I wish I had six hours just to go over this. This has been fascinating to research this. There's a couple of things. First of all, modern genetics is the key that really enlivens what Darwin did and said. When Darwin was doing this initial work, he was trying to explain observations with a theory, but there's not a lot of there there to really study until modern genetics gets rolling. We talked about Gregor Mendel a little bit, and then in the 20th century, we have modern genetics really coming on strong, and now there's something to really be studied here, which is how do genes work, where do traits come from, and how do traits change? And one of the most interesting discoveries over the last 20 years has been how the genetic code produces traits. When I was, when I was being educated, there was a, a common objection to Darwinism which said, well, we have genes, and these genes tell our bodies how to make things. They tell us how to make parts of the body, for one thing. And so if you have a mutation of a gene, then something will grow in a different way and then you'd have something to be selected against. So if you had an animal that had a gene which made an ear, then maybe that gene could be mutated and it would instead make a horn. If a horn was a better thing to have, if you could fight off a lion with the horn, then the animal with the horn would survive, which is very oversimplistic. Modern genetic knowledge now says that we understand that the genes that produce the parts of the bodies of animals and of people not only are there myriad, hundreds of thousands of genes that do this, but the genes also have a very complicated control structure. Up until about 20 years ago, a lot of our genome was called, well, until 10 years ago, a lot of our genome was called junk DNA. You ever heard that phrase, junk DNA? It comes out in the paper occasionally. Most of your genes are junk DNA. And that was a little bit jumping the gun because as the genome is understood more and more and more, most of the junk or a lot of the junk turns out that there are active parts that have jobs to do. And what we find is that these traits are coded for by genes and then that gene is controlled by another gene. Now here's an example of how that works. I should have had a picture of Darwin's finches. But if you remember last week we showed a picture of the different beaks on the finches that Darwin discovered on the Galapagos Islands. It turns out that one gene makes all those different beaks. It's the same genetic code that makes all those beaks. That's was puzzling at first. You say, wait, if it's the same gene, if all these birds have the same genetic code for the beak, how can they all have different beaks? Well, there's another gene in a different place in the code that tells the beak gene when to turn on and how long to stay on during the development of the chick in the egg. And on Darwin's finches, the one with the smallest beak and the one with the largest beak, that's a difference of 27 minutes in the egg. Now stop there for a minute just to revel in the complexity of how life works. When these little chicks are in the egg, the ones on the one island that are going to have the very largest beaks and the ones that the chicks on the other island have the very smallest beaks, 27 minutes apart, that gene will turn on during their, their time in the egg while they're developing. So no mutation of the beak-making gene was necessary. No random process had to come up with a new beak-making gene. It's the same gene. All that happened in that case was a modification of the control that said when to turn on. Now first, it's sort of amazing. I think all of us lay people can say it's kind of amazing that a difference of 27 minutes while this thing is in the egg for weeks will change what kind of beak it ends up with. But it makes this process of answering well, where do these new beaks come from? If you say you have these finches, they're on the different islands, they're eating different seeds, and that's really great, and I understand all that, but where did the longer beak come from in the first place? Well, it came from a mutation on one gene in one little place that's understandable how it happened that caused this other gene to turn on 27 minutes earlier. This understanding of how genetic information works is becoming richer all the time. This is something that people are working very hard in, trying to win Nobel Prizes in. This is one mechanism that we understand a lot better now. 
as to where the new traits come from that are being selected for and against by the lions or by all the other selection pressures. We'll do one more. There's hundreds of examples of this, but another example. So color vision is an amazing topic. Color vision is something that has arisen several times um, among animals. So most of us probably are colorblind. Statistically, there might be one person in here who is not who is who's colorblind. Most of us have color vision, and of course that person would be a male because it's a genetic trait that only happens to males. But most primates, most primates. Um, do not have that kind of color vision. No, primates have that kind of color vision. Um, if they were, if it was selected for, if the primates lived in trees where the environment was mostly green and it was a real evolutionary advantage to be able to see red. So we have ancestors that we know of by the common descent for all the reasons we talked about where color vision arose and became an evolutionary advantage because they're arboreal. They live in trees. And if you can see the red fruit, this is a real big advantage. And we benefit from that, we as human beings. So we have what's called trichromic vision. We basically have receptors for red, for red, green, and blue in our color vision. And then arboreal monkeys and primates and great apes that eat fruit typically have this trichromic vision. But most other mammals don't. Most other mammals are colorblind. Your dog, your cat, most all car carnivorous mammals are all colorblind. Well, okay, why are they colorblind? Well, reptiles and birds and most amphibians actually have color vision. In fact, reptiles have superior color vision to primates and people. They actually have what's called tetrachromic vision. They can see farther into the ultraviolet spectrum. They actually see more colors than we do. But during the age of the great reptiles, when the first mammals developed, what did the mammals do to make a living? They were out at night and they burrowed underground. Why? Because there were big lizards out there that could eat you during the day. If you burrow underground and you're only out at night, is color vision much of a help to you? No. So it was not selected for, so mutations disabled this awesome, which I wish we had, this awesome tetrachromic vision where reptiles can see all these colors plus some ultraviolet. And that went away in the early mammals. And then all of the carnivorous mammals that developed from the little shrews and things and all the great herbivorous mammals, none of them had color vision because there was apparently never a reason to have it. And then you get to the primates, now is when you can start getting a little bit of theology into it. You come to the primates with the immediate precursors of man and suddenly it becomes very important to have color vision and so it arises. And so the great apes and the primates that needed to see red fruit in the tree develop color vision. How did this develop? Well, it developed by something called gene duplication. Your cat and your dog and all the other colorblind mammals have a gene which codes for a certain kind of light receptor in the eye which senses light and dark, not color. In a human being and in the great apes, this receptor, there's actually, we have four. So we have three for color, red, blue, and green, and one for dark and light which is why your color vision doesn't work at night very well because only your light and dark receptors are working. The way this developed in our genetic code is that gene for the light and dark receptor was copied. And it was copied three times so that we had four copies of it. And then those copies, when they mutated, they didn't make an animal blind. Instead, they gave an animal different reception to different color. So it's a really interesting process. This color vision arises and goes away and arises and goes away several times in the evolutionary record. And this method of gene duplication where a gene is duplicated and then this superfluous gene can, can mutate and change without causing the animal any problem is another way that a new trait can arise. Now, this question of where new traits come from is subject to intense research right now. People are doing this every day and working on this. Like I said, there are Nobel Prizes to be won, so you can bet they're working very hard right now on this topic. All right, so we talked about where do new traits come from. Why do new traits appear quickly in the record? This is a good one. So when I was a kid, my dad's a geologist. We talked a little bit about he was the scientific influence on my life. And one of the things that I learned very early as a kid was I learned this principle of punctuated equilibrium that Darwin said, well, 
if these processes are working, they're working very slowly. And if these organisms are always under pressure, they're always going to be changing. There's always going to be changing. The wildebeest are going to be getting better. They're going to be selected for all these good traits. Darwin envisioned a tree of life which was very curvy, in which things never stayed the same for very long. The fossil record in 1859 did not reflect that. The fossil record reflected certain kinds of organisms changing rapidly to something else and staying that way for a long time and then changing rapidly to something else and staying that way for a long time. And Darwin said, yeah, this is problematic. He said, but I think the reason it's, the reason that it's this way is because we haven't discovered very many fossils yet. He said, I think that when the record is fleshed out, he said, I think it will show that everything is changing very gradually all the time. Has this proven to be true? No. Instead, the actual fossil record, this is vastly simplified, because there are some examples of very smooth change over long periods of time, but the actual fossil record looks a lot more like this, where something changes rapidly and then stays the same way for a very, very long period of time. So the best example of this, which is called a punctuated equilibrium. Equilibrium is an unchanging state, right? The best example of this are archaic species like the horseshoe crab. The horseshoe crab has looked like this for 445 million years. It's a very old animal. It's difficult, it's difficult to formulate an understanding of natural selection where everything's in competition all the time, and there's pressure being applied to organisms all the time, and any new traits that emerge are being selected for or against, it's hard to understand that in a way that allows the horseshoe crab to remain virtually identical for half a billion years. Does that make sense? It's difficult. It's a difficult understanding. Now, I'm going to use this to talk about how science works for a second, because if someone has a bone to pick with evolution, which I don't know how to have a bone to pick with a scientific theory, but if someone has a bone to pick with evolution or a bone to pick with evolutionists, then a lot of times we get the idea that there's a conspiracy. And I know a lot of religious people, particularly those at some of the very fundamentalist churches, we absolutely love our fundamentalist brothers and sisters. They've done a very poor job of relating to science in the 20th and 21st century. In some communities like that, it is a very typical thing to imagine that science is a conspiracy against religion. And that Darwinism is simply a religious idea that people hold for the sake of their atheism and that all of this is just propaganda. Well, let me tell you a story about this. So, the fossil record looks more like this. Darwin's idea predicts a little more like this. These are very broad ideas. So during the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, this began to gain pressure. The idea of a punctuated equilibrium being the more common expression of life in the fossil record, this was a pregnant idea. Now, did the entire scientific establishment clam up about it for fear of looking bad in front of creationists? No. Instead, careers were made out of this. Particularly, you may have heard about a scientist, an evolutionary biologist named Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould, for about 20 years, was the rock star of paleontology and evolutionary biology. Why? Because he said, we as a discipline, we scientists, we evolutionists, need to take the fossil record at face value. We need to say it's not a smooth, gradual change in all species, but that more often it's tremendously fast change that causes something new to arise, and it stays like that for a very long time. This idea of punctuated equilibrium was all the rage. This was everywhere. People were treating it as if it was the overthrow of Charles Darwin, that evolution was dead, and now it was punctuated equilibrium. If anything, the scientific community was too eager to throw Darwin away. Gould's career was made, and then he became a pop star. He was on TV all the time. There were PBS specials about him. He's on the cover of Scientific American. He's giving lectures all over the world. The thing is, over time, it became apparent that Gould didn't really have, this is important, he didn't have an alternate theory. There was no alternate theory here. He was just pointing out that the fossil record 
didn't fit with all of the orthodoxy that people had been telling each other about Darwinism for a long time. He said, punctuated equilibrium is something new. And everyone said, yes, it's something new. And they were really too eager to throw the baby out with the bathwater. After 20 years of Gould's career, everybody realized that there was nothing new here. That yes, these changes in organisms were fast. Faster than had been at first expected, but they still fit into the tree of life. There were still transitional forms. Everything was working pretty much the way Darwin had said. The rate of change just didn't appear to be at first glance explainable, but that there was no great, no new great idea here. Gould certainly didn't have it, and everybody just had to get back to work trying to figure out what had happened. And so everybody sobered up. People quit talking about Darwin, Darwin's theory as if it was going to be replaced by some work of Gould or one of his protégés. And they said, okay, so the fossil record doesn't look exactly the way we thought. However, we know that this process has been going on. We're just going to keep trying to understand it. Never, all the fear died down. But punctuated equilibrium is an interesting and basic aspect of the fossil record. And all the work that goes on now has to take this into account, that things like this exist. They exist in one form for a very, very long time. And that has to be explained eventually. There's a lot of, a lot of forms that are very old. Um, and the character of the fossil record, oh, the reason I brought up my dad, I need to finish that story. So, the reason why I understood punctuated equilibrium as a kid is because my dad's a geologist. What does geologists do? Well, he would go out to a well, and they would have the cores that had been drilled out of the earth, and they would have the samples of the rocks, and he would look at the rocks. He and the expert in paleontology would look at the rocks through the microscope, and what they were doing, they were trying to figure out precisely what rocks they were drilling through. And so they would look at the rocks through the microscope, and they would find the little tiny creatures, the little little diatoms and little corals, they'd find the little things with little tiny shells in the microscope, and they could use that to date the rocks. And they would say, oh, I see this, they called them bugs. They'd say, I see this kind of bug, therefore I know we're in this particular rock formation, because this is the kind of bug that you find in this particular rock everywhere in the world, because that's the kind of bug that was alive at the time. And this is how they did their job. They would look at the bugs in the rock and say, oh, I recognize that bug from my training. This is a bug that's about 400 million years old. Therefore, I know the rock we're digging through now is 400 million years old. Do you know what that requires? It requires that bugs are the same for a long period of time. It means that through a formation that may have taken 20 or 30 or 40 million years to deposit, it means the bugs have to be the same all during that time. And it also means the bugs have to change rapidly so the next formation has different bugs. And this is how the geologic column is. The fossils are pretty much the same in a layer, and then they're pretty much totally different but consistent in the next layer, and then they're different but consistent in the next layer. That's this. That's this idea drilled out of the rock at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. It works. It's something that people in industry just know. I don't think Gould's ideas were very much of a shock to the geologists that were looking at bugs in Houston as part of the oil boom. So all of these things are interesting. All of these things at first blush say, hmm, that may require some modification of theory. But these careers, paleontology, paleogenetics, evolutionary biology, People are working on them right now. This is, if there was nothing new to discover, why would anybody go into any of these fields? Why would they be studied? Why would anybody devote their lives to them if there weren't still questions to answer? These are the questions to answer. So, now, you hear occasionally, if you hang around the places and read the books that I read and are involved in this, you hear about evolution being a theory in crisis. Now, this was a very popular term to use during the time of punctuated equilibrium. Darwinism was a theory in crisis. Evolution is a theory in crisis. Is it a theory in crisis? Because now, now you get people who write books about intelligent design, and they say evolution is a theory in crisis. It's crumbling. Well, 
evolution is about as much a theory in crisis as gravity is. Gravity is a theory. There's a theory of universal gravitation. Do we know pretty much what gravity does? Yes. Can we describe what gravity does? Yes. Do we know how it works? Kinda. If you talk to a physicist about gravity and you say, do we know how gravity works? He'll say, kinda. We think, we anticipate. Hypothetically, there's a particle. <sighs> These are, this is the language of universal gravitation right now. We pretty much understand it, but there's still some very interesting difficulties with universal gravitation. Is it a theory in crisis? No, because nobody expects gravitation to be replaced with a different explanation. Is evolution a theory in crisis? No. There are still things to be discovered about it, like Mr. Horseshoe Crab and why he hasn't done anything interesting in half a billion years. But that doesn't mean that the descriptive power of the theory is lacking. It means there's more work to be done. And this is an important point. Science is an endeavor. Science is not a book. Science is not a set of facts which is set in stone. Science is something that people are actually doing right now. Everywhere the sun's shining, and a lot of places where it isn't, people are working on these things. They're working on them because they love it, or they're working on them because they're selfish and they want a Nobel Prize. I don't care. They're all working on it. So this is one thing that we need to know, is that a scientific theory is only in crisis if another theory, which is more descriptive of the observed data, is in the offering. And with neither gravity nor biological evolution is a better theory on offer at the moment. Does that make sense? All right, now we get to move to what I'm really interested in, the religious understandings of all this information. So first we need to talk about what is Orthodox Catholic thought as concerns this. I'm again going to use Ludwig Ott because Ludwig Ott is a widely respected source for formulations of Catholic dogma. God keeps all created things in existence, and God, through his providence, protects and guides all that he has created. That's basic Catholic theology. And we need to keep that in mind, because we have to now draw a line. This is the first time. I know some of you have waiting for this. We now have to draw a line between Catholicism and the prevailing orthodoxy of the day. A lot of folks want to do that first thing. They want to separate themselves from the world first thing. We have to actually wait till now, as Catholics, being honest, to separate ourselves from prevailing understandings. Either of these trees, whichever explanation is better for the particular species, time period that anyone's looking at or working on, both of those things, for most people in the world, represent a completely natural, unguided process which God is not the author of. For a Catholic, these processes represent a process which God protects and guides. This is an important understanding. Now, protects and guides have multiple definitions. We can understand that in different ways. But we cannot negotiate on this point. This process is protected and guided by God. Now we have to come to an understanding of what that means. There are two broad ways to understand God's protection and guidance of this process of the development and emergence of life. One is that this guidance of God is visible and it leaves evidence behind. This is broadly called in the modern context intelligent design. The second way to understand this is that this guidance is invisible and does not leave evidence behind. This is broadly called theistic evolution. At the bottom of the page, which of those two things, without even discussing them, which of those two things seems more like the Catholic position, that God's guidance of the world is visible and leaves evidence, or that God's guidance of the world is invisible and does not leave evidence? Well, what did we start with? The weather. 
as Catholics, do we believe that God, through his providence, protects and guides the entire world, including the weather? Yes, we do. However, do we expect to see evidence of God's guidance in the patterns of weather? No. I also think there's a nice parallel with sacraments here. We Catholics absolutely believe the sacraments are real sources of grace, right? Do we expect to be able to see that grace when we receive the sacraments? No. On the other hand, just to throw a twist in there, have there been visible Eucharistic miracles? Yes. This is a good topic. This is my favorite. This is what I've been waiting to get to. What you have here, I think, most basically, is this is going to be a vexing topic for someone that's going to aggravate them if they want to prove the existence of God. If they're going into this, if they're entering into this whole discussion and saying, you know, I'm going to investigate the origin of life. And if they're investigating the origin of life because they say, I'm going to do it to prove the existence of God, this is going to be a vexing topic. They're not going to like it. If they're going into it to understand the created world better and say, well, I want to know how God did it, I think they can find their way through there. If somebody's going into this to prove that God exists, to find the evidence that they can take to someone and see I told you so, I don't think they're going to have a good time with this. It'd be the same thing if somebody was trying to prove the real presence in the Eucharist and said, I'm going to find real proof. And they went around Italy and found all the Eucharistic miracles in Italy. And they brought back and they stole every one of those bloody corporals and brought them back and said, see, the host bled on this. And some skeptic would say, all I see is blood. I don't see a miracle. If you go into something with the idea you're going to prove the existence of God, I'm telling you, you're probably going to be disappointed because God doesn't really admit of being proved that easily. So we'll go into it now. Intelligent design. Intelligent design is hot, hot, hot right now. It was hotter about five, seven, eight years ago. Intelligent design is still plenty hot, though. This is very, very, very popular in the very popular and vibrant um, evangelical Christian movement in the United States of America. It's not popular anywhere else. But there are a tremendous number of people, and we love them to death, who are evangelical, non-denominational Christians in the United States of America. Millions of people. This is a very influential social block in our country. I think we're all aware of this. This idea of intelligent design is exceedingly popular in this very large, powerful group of people. Therefore, it has currency. This is a modification. Remember Paley with natural theology, the idea that all animals were perfectly designed for whatever job they're doing. Intelligent design is, I think, the best way to understand it, a modification of Paley's watchmaker argument. Not stating that all species are perfectly designed, but that some, not all, aspects of life are too complex to have been evolved by natural processes or too complex to have evolved in the time allowed by the fossil record. This is a very, very interesting thing to talk about because to the lay person, this can appear to be a very reasonable scientific theory. But we need to investigate this and we need to say, is this a reasonable scientific theory? There are basically two methods of proposing intelligent design. One was very popular 20 years ago. It was called irreducible complexity. Another one is more popular today. It's called the rate of evolution. Irreducible complexity. Um, this book right here in 1996 pretty much got the ball rolling on irreducible complexity. This is by Michael Behe. Michael Behe is a biochemist and he's a Catholic, interestingly enough. Uh, most of his compatriots in the intelligent design movement are evangelical Christians. A lot of the Catholic scientists uh, a lot of Catholic scientists oppose Michael Behe because they're not intelligent design advocates. Um, the book is all about irreducible complexity. And basically, what Behe says in the book is he says, well, if you take a system, anything that an animal has and uses, whether it's a group of chemicals that do a function, whether it's something physical that does a job, if it has a bunch of parts that all work together, he said, then how could it have evolved? Because you need all the parts 
for it to work. That's very commonsensical. So my eye has many different parts. It has a cornea, which is the front surface, which does some refracting of light and protects it. It has the eyeball, which is the white sclera part. It has the optic muscles that move it. It has the nerve that takes the information. It has the retina, which has all the light receptors on it. It has the lens, which is pulled and pushed to focus the light. And without all of these parts, it's not an eye. So how does it evolve? How do you, through many small changes over a long period of time, from not having an eye, how do you then develop all of these different parts? Without all these parts, it's not an eye and it doesn't work. And you can take any system in an animal or a plant, and you could say, look at all of the parts that go into that system. They all have to be there in order for it to work. So how do you, the word would be iterate. How do you make all these iterations over time, changing little things, changing little things, if you're always selecting for the best animal along the way, the one most likely to breed? This is the very, I think this is the very first serious debate that Darwin got into over his theory was with a fellow named uh, George Jackson Myvart, um, who actually died excommunicated from the Catholic Church for being a heretic. An interesting guy, read about him. Um, the ver one of the very first things he actually debated um, was uh, he debated uh, George Myvart, and um, the argument that George Myvart made was of what use is half a wing? Of what use is half a wing? If a bird flies with its wing, and you say that birds evolved, and they evolved from creatures without wings, then what did all those creatures with half a wing, what were they good for, and why were they selected for? It's a pretty good argument. It has some teeth. So, the example, I'll go all the way back to the beginning here, the example that Michael Behe used as a device with irreducible complexity is he said, look at a mousetrap. He said, a mousetrap is like a biological system, like a part of an animal. He said, it works because all the parts are there. And he said, how could you evolve to a mousetrap? And a mousetrap only has five parts. He said, some biochemical systems have thousands of parts. How can you evolve to them? I, I bought the book. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was interested enough, I bought this book. I've got a lot of books on intelligent design. It's an interesting concept. Where has the debate gone? So, there have been a lot of irreducible complexity examples proposed. A lot of them. Um, this book proposes one that um, was really fascinating. It's the bacterial flagellum. A flagellum is the tail. Um, it's a little curly Q tail on a bacteria that spins like the outboard motor on a, on a boat and it propels the bacteria through its environment in its search for what it needs. First of all, a moment to ponder the amazing complexity of life that something the size of a bacterium has an outboard motor. But what B he says in, in this book, which is, like I said, I, I bought it, I've read it a couple of times, I like it. Um, he says the outboard motor has all of these parts, 50 some odd chemical parts that all go together one of the things that I do in my work is I design electric motors, and I, it looks exactly like an electric motor. It's really cool. And B, he says, if you don't have all of those parts, he says, the flagellum won't spin. Therefore, how can you evolve to a flagellum? Because you need all the parts. If you're missing one part, it doesn't spin. Of what use to a bacteria is a flagellum that doesn't spin? Very commonsensical. He presents several other examples. And there are many, many other examples of irreducibly complex, let's put that in quotes, irreducibly complex parts and structures. And here's where intelligent design comes in. B, he says, and the intelligent design crowd says, if you can't evolve to it, it must have been designed by an agency with intelligence. And when you present it like this, that's a complex little motor. It's more complex than the motors I design, and I'm intelligent. Therefore, it must have been designed, and of course, the, the idea being that the intelligent creator must be God. So, we'll stop with the facts here for a second. We'll talk about emotion. This idea drove people crazy. It drove people crazy on both sides. It drove a tremendous number of evangelical Christians crazy because they said, finally, we have an explanation for God's action in the creation of animals and plants, which is compatible with all the current science of the day, 
and it really shows God's power. And then the other side, people who work professionally in evolutionary science and professional atheists, to be fair, went crazy on the other side and said, this is just creationism. You're sneaking, cre we finally beat you back on creationism, you've been discredited, and now you're sneaking it back in this way. And a whole series of ugly fights over school textbooks. If you remember, we talked about William Jennings Bryan and his crusade to have evolution banned from classrooms during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, how that went on. And then that petered out to some degree, and then in the 90s, Textbook fights start all over again around intelligent design. What really aggravated the anti-intelligent design side, there was a textbook which was very, very popular um, in Christian schools, which was called Of Pandas and People. And it was a Christian science textbook, and it was about creationism. And what the publisher of that book did wasn't a very good way to write a textbook, but they wanted to be up with the times. So they took their creation science textbook, they took all the instances of the word creator and creation out, and they put in designer and design, and republished it and sent it out to Christian schools, and this was updated. Now that was a really, really poor way to write a textbook, but of course the anti-ID people got copies of the book and said, see, this fight got extremely nasty in a lot of courtrooms, in a lot of school districts around the country for a long time. And it was interesting because intelligent design was not going to be debated in peer-reviewed scientific journals, but it got debated in courtrooms. And some very interesting decisions came out of it. Um, what is the criticism of this? Well, it's interesting. One of my particular favorite authors, um, uh, a, a Catholic biochemist, said, well, this is an irreducibly complex system. You're right. It's take away one part, it's no good as a mousetrap. He said, but I notice that I can take away one of those parts. I can take away the trigger, or I can take away the catch, or I can take away the hook, and it still makes a darn good tie clip. And what he meant by that example is, We don't have to show that this structure is not irreducibly complex. We only have to show that the parts of the structure had some other use. So because this was a hot topic, and it was actually the subject of court cases, people went into high gear to study all the biochemical systems that were mentioned in this book. Blood clotting. Blood clotting is tremendously, if you ever want to be amazed at how your body works, read about how blood clots. There are so many different chemicals that have to operate in a certain way at a certain time or else you're, you're a hemophiliac. It's an amazing thing. So blood clotting, because it has 20 some odd steps, was also advanced as an irreducibly complex system that must have been designed by God. Well, guess what everybody's grant request was the next year, working on the flagellum or blood clotting. And with all these people going to work on the flagellum and blood clotting, it didn't take very long for the claim of irreducible complexity to be disproven to a certain degree. Just like the criticism of the mousetrap, that you take away some of these parts, it's still a good tie clip. The flagellum, if you take away some of its parts, is very, very similar to a bacterial structure which is used to poison host cells, a particular secretion system. The blood clotting chemicals, all 20 some out of the blood clotting chemicals which were irreducibly complex, were in a short period of time shown to actually work either as clotting agents or for other biochemical functions in smaller groups of three and seven and different things. The argument from irreducible complexity took a lot of hits because of the publicity from this book and from the court cases, and it has been backed off from. You don't find new books coming out today saying that irreducible complexity will prove that God created things. It's just not that popular anymore. Now, can we criticize the criticism? Well, yeah. You still have to explain how you get from a tie clip to a mousetrap. There still has to be intermediate forms there. But, and this is something I think we should all pick up from this, if you stake your claim on something and you say, this, I've found it, proof of God, this is irreducibly complex, or this is too complicated, if you stake your claim and you say, this is it, 
you better be careful because somebody will come along and work real, real hard and they'll do experiments on it and they'll figure out how it could have happened naturally. And then if you've staked your claim that God exists or that God acted on this one thing and it's disproven, then what do you have? You have a red face and you have egg all over it and then you have to go on to the next thing. This can be seen as a process. This process has a name. It's called the God of the Gaps. It's where if you see a gap in evolutionary theory, something that can't currently be explained, then it's popular in the intelligent design movement to point and say, aha, this cannot be explained. I submit that God did that. And everybody gets very excited and they write books about it. But if the other side that wants a naturalistic explanation works very, very hard and they say, well, no, actually we can explain that, then you start to see it. This is going to happen again and again and again. This is criticized. This God of the gaps idea is very highly criticized. And so I have on there, the criticism can be criticized, and so on. Again, this argument's available 24-7-365 on the internet if you want to get into it. So, intelligent design is still alive and well, but it's now backed off of irreducible complexity, and now it's about the rate of evolution. So, right now it is very popular to publish an intelligent design book with a trilobite on the cover. There are lots of books with trilobites on the cover. Um, why trilobites? This is a trilobite, by the way. Because this is one of those fossils that appears out of nowhere. It's one of those fossils. The type of animal didn't exist. Nothing like it existed. And suddenly, bam, it exists, fully formed. Right now, the hottest topic in intelligent design is the Cambrian explosion. Um, the Cambrian is a time period. It was about 420 to 450 million years ago. At the beginning of the Cambrian, there was no complex animal. There were just single-celled organisms and colony organisms and little things like, kind of like sea anemones. And then the change in the rock strata, suddenly there's all kinds of things. There's things that are, they look like arachnids and things with segments and things with legs and things with eyes, things with primitive backbones. They come out of nowhere. That was a big point in punctuated equilibrium. And so right now it's very popular to write and say that happened too quickly. Nothing can explain the explosion of life at the beginning of the Cambrian. I've got some pictures of some wonderful Cambrian organisms. Um, I intended to remember their names, but I can't do it right now, so we'll call them Cambrian bugs. So all of these things have different body plans, different shapes. Um, they all have vastly different ways of being living organisms that are, require a lot of different genetic material, different genes operating in different ways to make all of these different things. And in the fossil record, they all arise, not overnight, but geologically speaking, they arise overnight. And so this is something that the intelligent design community has jumped on and said, aha, this cannot be explained naturally by Darwinian principles. What would be the problem with saying that? Think about that for a second. What would be the problem with that? Another one, which is very current in intelligent design right now, is whale evolution. Whale evolution is fascinating. So whales are mammals. Um, they give birth to live young. They're warm-blooded. They're mammals. And so they didn't evolve from fish. They evolved from land-dwelling creatures. Mammals came from reptiles on land, so you have land-dwelling creatures, something that's kind of like a wolf with hooves. It's a weird creature here on top of the chain. And then we see these are all, by the way, remember I talked about last week, anybody that says we don't have good transitional fossils showing how things develop in the bull. We see this development of whales. Obviously, everything up to here is extinct now. We had this development of whales. It's pretty fast. So we have this development from a completely land-dwelling animal with feet here at about 55 million years ago. And here at 40 million years ago, we have whales that live their entire life in the ocean 15 million years. That's fast. In evolutionary terms, that's extremely fast. 
So it was already a hot topic in intelligent design to say, we don't think this is explainable by natural selection. We don't think this can be done. Now that was before a couple of years ago when one of these fossils right here for a basilosaur was found in, Green, uh, found in Ant Antarctica that was actually 48 million years old, which puts it way back here with these guys, which means the whole sequence may be compressed into as little as 5 million years. So if it was fast at 15 million, now it's super fast at 5 million. So now I'm sure somebody's writing a book right now about how whale evolution proves the existence of God. I'll buy it, sure. I'll enjoy reading it. But why am I not going to jump on that bandwagon? Because now, with the work that's being done with whales, who knows what will be discovered about the natural world? If my belief in the existence of God was pinned to the fact that all of my blood clotting chemicals work together, I would have a problem now because it can be shown pretty reasonably that that system could be evolved naturally. If I pin my hopes in the existence of God, not on my faith, not on my religion, but on whale evolution, and what if that's shown to be a completely reasonable natural process? The criticism we're building up to here is that if you pin your hope in the existence of God on the noise that he made with his hammer when he struck the mountains and made thunder, you would have lost your faith when you discovered how weather worked. It's a dangerous thing to pin the existence of God on some natural process that we don't yet understand. Because there's every reason to expect that we will, at some point, understand the natural aspect of it. This is why Catholics don't typically go in for this. What's the big problem with intelligent design? All right? What is science? It's a study of nature. Why can science only study nature? Because only nature is repeatable and predictable. What is intelligent design saying? It's saying that some things we do not understand scientifically, we won't ever understand scientifically because God did it, which is not a scientific understanding, and it can't be tested as science. I asked the hypothetical question. If someone's working on some aspect of evolutionary biology or paleontology, and let's say he had a colleague who was an intelligent design advocate, and he came across a thorny problem and said, I just don't see yet, I just don't see the mechanism yet, how this developed in this way in this period of time. And let's say his colleague said, well, then God must have done it. What should the first scientist do? Quit? No. The way science operates is he'll go back and he'll look for a new understanding. He'll look for additional evidence that'll point to a new theory. That's how science operates. What you come up with is that intelligent design is not science so much as advice to quit doing science. And this is controversial. And I don't mean a little bit. It's incredibly controversial. So one of the most outspoken critics of intelligent design theory in the world Father George Coyne, who was, until several years ago, um, the uh, director of the Vatican Observatory. Did you know the Vatican ran an observatory? Vatican Observatory is pretty awesome. It's at Castel Gandolfo outside of Rome. Um, now, Rome's gotten so big and there's so much artificial light in Rome that it's not much use as an actual observatory, but they keep the collection of meteorites. They have one of the largest collections of meteorites in the world, um, and they have their administrative center there, and then they do the actual obser observing in uh, Arizona. They have a couple of telescopes they rent time on, and they actually own one telescope out in, uh, in Arizona. And so Father Coyne, who was a Jesuit from America, ran the Vatican Observatory, and Father Coyne was outspoken about the relationship between the church and science. And Father Coyne is famous for saying, intelligent design isn't science. Now, to the Western ear, when you say something isn't science, that is essentially the same as saying something isn't true. What Father Coyne meant, it doesn't follow the scientific method, first off. It can't be science. And here begins the confusion. Welcome to Italy. So, the first statement, 
from Brother Guy Consolmagno. He's the curator of uh, the meteorite collection and a planetary astronomer there, and I think that he really got to the bottom of this. He said, intelligent design is one of those phrases that means something different to everybody. To part of the world, it's a code phrase for the worst sort of creationism, and to other people, it means you can't use science as a way to disprove God. So some of our seminarians from Tyler are educated in Rome. Um, we had one of the guys here last week, uh, Deacon Staling, who's going to be ordained in January, was here. He was educated in Rome. And when we talk to these guys that are educated in Rome, and they talk about this experience of Roman Catholicism there at the Vatican, they said one thing that's true, the Romans don't understand Protestants. They have no experience with Protestants. In their view, the world's Catholic, because Italy is pretty much Catholics and atheists. And they said they don't understand Protestants. And I remember one quote of note, is uh, a couple of the guys have actually said that people in Italy have asked them if Mormons really exist because they've never met one. So you have the Vatican Observatory staff is mostly American Jesuits and they're in America all the time. They're very concerned with the state of science and science education in America and they understand intelligent design in that way. Benedict XVI started using the phrase intelligent design during his pontificate in a completely different way. He meant something like, we are not the casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. And then CatholicNews.com summed that up and said, it probably doesn't help the Pope has shown a fondness for the phrase intelligent design. He uses it to describe the idea that whatever the biological process is involved, the natural world as a whole appears to witness to a divine creator. And Father Coyne summed it up and said they don't have any idea what intelligent design means in the USA. You have the people at the Vatican are using intelligent design to mean something very Catholic. That God is the curator of the universe. That he has an intelligent interest in it. And they're using this phrase and people in the United States are saying the Vatican endorses intelligent design. Here's what happened. It's fascinating. So there's a group of people, including some Catholics, that run the biggest pro-intelligent design think tank in the world out in Seattle called the Discovery Institute. And the Discovery Institute started promoting this idea that the Vatican had gone pro-intelligent design in the mid-2000s. And so they, the, the Discovery Institute was somehow involved in getting this guy, Cardinal Schoenborn, the Cardinal of Vienna, Austria, who was the primary editor of our catechism, very smart guy, the Discovery Institute was primarily involved in getting him to write an editorial for the New York Times in which he espoused a belief in intelligent design. Remember, the Europeans don't know what Americans mean by intelligent design. So, Cardinal Schoenborn wrote an editorial for the New York Times, you can go read it online, in which he basically says the same thing that Pope Benedict said. We're not an accident. And so the people in the United States read this and said, wow, the Vatican is allied with the evangelicals. They all believe in intelligent design. They don't think that Darwinism works. Father Coyne went crazy. There he is, going crazy. Father Coyne wrote vehemently against Cardinal Schoenborn and wrote all of his... Uh, all of his uh, problems with intelligent design and got really, uh, really direct with it. He essentially compared what Cardinal Schoenborn had written to a belief in a thunder god, that God was actively directing all of these processes by occasionalism. And of course, Cardinal Schoenborn said, that's not what I meant. And again, Father Coyne says, you don't understand what they mean by intelligent design. So Cardinal Schoenborn was then forced to write a book in which he clarified his comments and his, in his book, exactly like what Benedict said, exactly this European understanding of God as an intelligent curator of the universe. And then Father Coyne, who was already way past retirement age at this point, retired in 2006. And so the media picked this up and said, ah, the Pope fired him because he got into a public fight with Cardinal Schoenborn. And, of course, Father Coyne said, no, 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 that didn't happen, you bunch of idiots. This is the confusion, and Catholics oftentimes get caught in this. So, intelligent design is this 
particular thing in the United States. And it's this particular way of criticizing evolutionary theory, which says if there's some part of it we don't understand yet, that must mean that God did it. And we've already criticized that and talked about it. And we can see that this is not something we can expect European churchmen with no experience of American evangelical Protestantism. This is not something we can expect everybody to understand. And this is what we get from it, the confusion. Does that make, not that it makes sense, but do you see how these things go wrong? Ah, Italy. More confusion. So, I want to talk about this as a social phenomenon of intelligent design. So this is a movie that came out in 2008. And um, the, uh, the narrator there is Ben Stein. And I like some of Ben Stein's commentary. I like some of his economics. But Ben Stein should stay out of science. He should stay out of science forever. He should stay doing Visine commercials. So this film was designed to expose a conspiracy in the scientific and academic establishment to keep intelligent design advocates from getting tenure, to keep them out of good jobs, to keep the idea down. But, there are a couple of problems with it. First off, the criticisms of the film, the people that are purported in the film to have been denied tenure and kept down and done all of these things because of intelligent design, if you actually go back and you look at each of their biographies, which people have done, nothing of the sort happened. A lot of it was fabricated. That's strike one. Second thing is a lot of prominent atheistic scientists were interviewed, and they were interviewed for the film. First of all, they told they were being interviewed for a different film. Then they were interviewed in such a way to bring out their atheism so that their atheism looked cartoonish and clownish. And of course, if you get somebody who's as wild and raving an atheist as Richard Dawkins and you get him talking about atheism, you can get him to say some pretty foolish things. And Ben Stein got him and other atheists to say some foolish things. They actually went out and found the most unreasonable scientists in the world. If you ever watch the movie, it's interesting just to see how crazy this got. They did find some loony birds to talk to, but these were not mainstream scientists. Among mainstream evolutionary scientists, about 50% of mainstream evolutionary scientists say that they are theists. They believe in God. Not one single person like that was interviewed for the film. Only raving loony bird atheists strike two. And thirdly, in any kind of a debate, it's a, it's a rule of debate now that if a debate goes on long enough and gets nasty enough, someone's going to call somebody else Hitler. It's called an at Hitlerium argument. <laughs> and at the end of the film, at the end of the film, sure enough, Ben Stein goes and tours a concentration camp and he makes the case that the Nazis killed Jews because of Darwinism, strike three. So I wanted to like the film. It was really pretty awful. Um, it was very popular. This was something that was highly promoted in evangelical churches, and it was actually it was a successful film, but it doesn't really get at the philosophical, theological, and scientific problems raised by intelligent design. And any time that you have to call somebody Hitler to win an argument against them, that's a fail. So this is an example of some of the cultural flotsam and jetsam that has come out of the intelligent design movement. I only bring it up for interest for that reason. So, what's the alternative to this? Remember, we said Catholic Orthodoxy We'll go all the way back here. Catholic orthodoxy is that God keeps all created things in existence and God, through his providence, protects and guides all that he has created. Well, if we don't find intelligent design to be the way to go, which I'll tell you, I don't, then what is our alternative? Well, our alternative is generally called theistic evolution. The understanding of that would be that evolution is a real, natural process, but with a purpose reflecting the will of God. It is the unfolding of a divine plan. At this point, Catholics are oftentimes very happy to point out that the word evolution comes from the Latin evolere, which means unfolding, or like to unroll the scroll. That something is hidden and it becomes visible. So, St. Augustine, from way, way back, remember St. Augustine was 5th century, 
St. Augustine, again, that wonderful book on the literal meanings of Genesis, it is therefore causally that Scripture has said that earth brought forth crops and trees in the sense that it received the power of bringing them forth. In the earth from the beginning, in what I might call the roots of time, God created what was to be in times to come. The idea that evolution is how God allows the world to manifest his will in creation. That it happens naturally, it happens according to his will. Now, the uh, nat National Center for Science Education is a secular body which is sort of a clearinghouse for information about all these textbook fights that go on all around the country. Um, it has been run by a lady named Eugenie Scott. She may still be in charge of it. And she's not a Catholic and no friend of Catholics. Um, but she's real straightforward and she just says, theistic evolution is the position of the Catholic Church because she doesn't see anything else coming out of the Catholic Church. So from an outside observer who's trying to keep everybody's opinion straight, she said, yeah, the official position of the Catholic Church appears to be theistic evolution. Well, it's not written down anywhere. There's been no papal encyclical about this. However, if you take the temperature of the way Rome is going on this topic for the last 70 years, I'd say, yeah, that's pretty much correct. Theistic evolution is the way that Rome has been understanding this for a long, long time. So my favorite theistic evolutionist, I'm going, to plug, I'm going to plug this guy. If you're interested in this topic, you should read Finding Darwin's God. Um, this is by Ken Miller, who's a Catholic biochemist. Um, he says, I believe that God is active and involved, he means in creation, but I don't think that requires the deity to accomplish his own purposes, to violate the rules that he set up. God exists outside of nature and is the reason for nature. Therefore, when we see something happening according to the laws of nature, we see the hand of God at work. This is a very basic Catholic understanding of the origin of plants and animals and the life on earth, is that the scientific knowledge that we gain is true and that it is reflective and explanatory of how God does things. It's very simple. This understanding is what my dad learned in parochial school in the 30s and 40s. This has been, you know, there was a time in a lot of American states, particularly in the South, during the William Jennings Bryant campaign, when it was illegal to teach evolution in a public school because the public schools were controlled by the Protestant majority. And the only place that you could go to learn about evolution was the parochial school. And this is the understanding that the nuns were teaching to the students in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So I'll recommend, and I, you know, I recommend all of these books. I, don't, I think everybody, if they, if they can, you should read intelligent design books. I don't think anybody should reject any aspect of intelligent design on the basis of a half-hour talk about it. Um, so I, I recommend all of these books. In particular, this one, Darwin's Doubt, is a good overview of paleontology in general. Nothing wrong with it. Um, I think you can skip Darwin's Black Box. He has a new one called The Edge of Evolution. This one's just out of date. Um, but a couple of books that I actually do recommend seriously um, are Finding Darwin's God by Ken Miller, because Ken Miller is a Catholic, and he has a very Catholic understanding of this. And if as a Catholic you want to know what is current Catholic thought on this, that's a good book for it. Um, this is a book by Francis Collins. Francis Collins is an evangelical, but he was also the geneticist who was in charge of the Human Genome Project. Um, definitely uh, a respected guy. And this is his apologetic for theistic evolution. It's really good. Um, and then, oh, any book by Ken Miller I can, I can recommend. Um, not that Ken Miller is, you know, perfect. Ken Miller is... Uh, Ken Miller can be a vicious guy when he's going after Michael Behe. It's kind of scary sometimes. Okay, so if all of this makes sense, if the relationship between theistic evolution, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on theistic evolution because theistic evolution is just a theistic understanding of what science discovers. Theistic evolution doesn't add anything to it. Theistic evolution doesn't seek to falsify any of it. Theistic evolution just says, well, we're 150 plus years into this project of understanding how life developed in this evolutionary model. Can we understand that as Catholics? Yes. Well, that's theistic evolution for us. There's not a lot else to say about it. 
If you want to hear all the gory details of how Ken Miller thinks it actually operates on the subatomic level, which is cool, buy the book. It's pretty awesome. So now we can go into human evolution. And this is where things get really dicey. I know we had a pretty spirited discussion about this during the Q&A last time. Let's go through it one more time. It'll be short, I promise. So this is an evolutionary sequence of skulls of human ancestors. Here's the brain capacity of different ancestors in the human sequence. Although this is Neanderthal man, and that's not in our direct line. That's an adjunct. That's not a direct ancestor. Um, it's an interesting thing. If you look at these skulls, you can see that, well, it's obvious there's a direction. Something is being developed here. Um, brain capacity is what everything else in human evolution is mortgaged for. We obviously hold a very large cranium. It's big and expensive and delicate, and it holds a very large, big, expensive, and delicate brain. But it's interesting. Um, you know what I wish we could have? I wish I could have that brain and this jaw, because that would be really cool, because you could bite and you could crush big things, but you can't. You know why? Because to have this big brain, the growth plates in your head have to stay loose for a lot longer so the brain can develop. The growth plates in our skull don't fuse. You know, babies are born with that moldable skull, so that giant head can be born. And these, these uh, joints in our skull don't fuse until we're in our early 30s. And so we can't have this giant jaw because this jaw has a muscle that activates it that's about as big as the muscle in your thigh. And if you had a muscle this big on your jaw, it would crush your head. So in human evolution, what has to happen? What are we selecting for? Well, the giant brain is being selected for. And what's being selected against? Well, a jaw that would compromise that structure. It's not immediately obvious why this brain was worth more than this jaw. Because if you went to a baboon and you took away that giant jaw, that would be a problem for that baboon. This is the first most basic and simple but first aspect of the mystery of how did this happen. And I think that if someone's going to look and say, I see God's hand in this, if you're going to look and see it anywhere, I think most reasonably, I think you're going to see it here. So, we have this. You could talk about the rest of the human body, but it's not nearly as interesting to talk about the evolution of the rest of the human body. This is, this is it. This is, this is where the real humanity is evolving. So, there has been an encyclical, a papal encyclical, specifically on the topic of human evolution. A papal encyclical is a for real papal teaching. It means it requires the submission and obedience of Catholics. This is a for real thing. Now, an encyclical can use different types of language. If the Pope really wants to put the hammer down on something, it's very well established in the church that the Pope can anathematize something or someone. Different people have been anathematized, Martin Luther, some of the other heresiarchs, or you can anathematize an idea or a concept. Pope Pius XII, when he wrote this encyclical, he put the hammer down, but he put the hammer down softly because nothing and no one was anathematized. Instead, he just said... Some things are allowable and some things are not. Let's talk about what those are. Those are important. So the first thing, I had to shorten it here a little bit, but uh, paragraph 36 basically says that although it's allowable to look into this idea that the human body came from pre-existing matter, that would be this and this. Pope says, that's allowable. That's not a tremendous problem for Catholics. He said, the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. Souls are immediately created by God. This, we can understand as a natural process, the soul is immediately created by God. Now, 37, paragraph 37, he says, we're not given that sort of freedom to believe in what's called polygenism. Polygenism is the idea, which was already current in evolutionary biology back in the 50s, that because 
It's not individual animals that evolve, it's populations of animals that evolve. We've talked about that. That if human beings are evolving, then these are populations of thousands or millions of individuals. Now, if you have thousands or millions of individuals that are becoming human, then we have a problem because one dogma of the faith is that original sin is the sin of Adam. That there was a father of the human race who sinned, and this is known as the fall. And that the Pope stressed this was a real event. Since it's a real event, there really is a father of the human race. Therefore, he said, you cannot, you cannot subscribe to polygenism, meaning you can't teach it as fact, you can't use it in, you, you basically can't make use of it as fact while it is, and he said it is certainly, at least now, in contradiction to Catholic dogma. Now, he could have put the hammer down and he could have said forever, anathema sit, but he didn't. He held back from that and he said because it is not apparent how it can be reconciled with Catholic dogma. They don't appear to go together. Now, if a pope says they don't appear to go together, then we can only, because he had the option of the big hammer available to him, I think the majority opinion among Catholic scholars is that he held back for a reason. The reason would be to allow for the potential of some development, maybe, in some way along this topic. Pius XII was no fan of evolution. It's well known that Pius XII really hoped that it was a fad. And he writes this encyclical as if he holds out some possibility that it could be a fad. And if you read the encyclical, which I really recommend doing, particularly these two paragraphs, you can see that he really hopes it's going to go away. He hopes that there's some other alternate theory that's going to come up. But, he says, because the evolution of plants and animals and even of the human body does not present an immediate problem for Catholic theology, go ahead and study it, work on it. But don't forget the souls created by God and polygenism is a problem because of original sin. So we come forward from 1950 with that understanding. Oh, this right here, if, hum, the, if the human body is evolved and it comes from pre-existing non-human matter, but then the souls created by God, so humans become ensouled at some point in time, that's called special transformism, the transformation there being from animal to human by the a rational soul being given to the first humans. Special transformism. So special transformism is no, after uh, Pope Pius XII says it's allowable, this becomes Catholic orthodoxy. Um, so Pope John Paul II, I've got a couple of quotes from him. Pius XII stressed the central point that the human body takes its origin from pre-existent living matter, the spiritual souls immediately created by God. Consequently, theories of evolution which, in accordance with the philosophies inspiring them, consider the mind as emerging from the forces of living matter, the idea that humans evolved humanity, that everything that we are is a result of evolution, and nothing came from God, John Paul said, remember, no to that. Benedict had a really beautiful thing to say about special transformism. Um, the clay became man at the moment in which a being for the first time was capable of forming, however dimly, the thought of God. Um, this is, you can find this quote all over the internet. It's a beautiful, beautiful quote. Um, if you get time to study this, I, I, I really would. Benedict uh, wrote and said some really beautiful things about the genesis of humanity and about what it meant to be created in relation to God. And um, I, would, I would study them if at all possible. But Benedict says, we know when this happened. We know when this special transformism happened. It happened when the human being was able to comprehend God. Now, in a really clunky biological way, I think what Benedict is saying is that when human beings were able to be ensouled, when they were able to contain a rational spirit, they were. Where'd that happen? Well, it's a fun parlor game, if you're a Catholic and you want to dabble in anthropology, to look at the history of human culture and say, when'd that happen? So, 
Would it be when humans started making tools? Would it be when humans started cooking? Would it be when humans started painting on cave walls? When humans started making artwork and wearing jewelry? What would be evidence of a soul? What would we consider evidence of a soul to be? Well, John Paul sort of answered that. And he said, the moment of transition to the spiritual cannot be the object of this kind of observation. John Paul's opinion about it was, you're not going to be able to tell. You're not going to find evidence of this. You're not going to know what the moment is. So, now we go to polygenism. Um, it's established from a scientific perspective. It's established that this evolution that occurred was thousands of individuals. It's pretty easy to show that it was not just two in the biological evolutionary record. One of the easiest ways to show that is a lot of our genes that we have, you know, there's one of two choices on the genes. Eye color is that way. You carry, carry two genes and you can be homozygous, heterozygous, but if one person carries two genes for something and their spouse carries two genes for something, that's a maximum of four genes. And that means you get four genes in the pool to pick from. So if you have Adam and Eve and they each carry two genes for this, then that's the pool. But actually, our race carries many, many, many more genes for that, meaning there was never a bottleneck of just two people, or else all these genes would be missing that we actually have in the population. Little simple proofs like that we can see. On the other hand, you could make the point um, that Genesis teaches polygenism. How could you make the point the book of Genesis teaches polygenism? Well, the old second grade question, who was Cain's wife? Why when God curses Cain, why does Cain say, whoever I meet is going to kill me? Who's he going to meet? His mom and dad? When Cain has to go away, when he has to leave the garden, where does he go? He goes to the land of Nod. There's a land of Nod? Who's there? There are some very clunky second grade answers to these questions, like, well, it must have been his other brothers and sisters. Really? Well, Seth wasn't born yet. This kind of analysis of Genesis doesn't get you very far. And again, going back to Vatican II, when you're dealing with this, you have to be sensitive to the genre. We're dealing with something which is Jewish mythology, Jewish theological mythology. We can't get all of these answers. We only know that Pius XII and the Council of Trent and the popes and councils before said there was a fall. It's something real. You know, like I think I told y'all, um, that was the first thing a Catholic theologian ever said that ever struck me was um, the first, first Catholic theologian I ever listened to in RCIA years and years, 15 years ago, said that uh, if you don't believe in original sin, he said, come to New York with me. We'll walk down the street. I'll prove it to you. And G.K. Chesterton, great uh, Catholic writer, said that original sin was the one Catholic dogma that you could immediately prove objectively just by knowing people. And, of course, the popes and councils have always said, yeah, original sin is real, and it's taught in Scripture, it's a real thing, and it really came from Adam. So, like Humana Generis says, it is in no way apparent how such an opinion, polygenism, can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents, the teaching authority the church proposed with regard to original sin. So, is anybody working on this problem? Yeah, few people. I think an army of thousands should be working on it. But, I don't get my wishes. Um, if somebody wants to actually read about this, there's some pretty good sources. Um, Dr. Kenneth Kemp um, is a philosopher um, at the University of St. Thomas, and he wrote a really nice article, Science, Theology, and Monogenesis. Monogenesis. I've got the URL, which you can find on YouTube later if you want. And a real flurry was made in uh, 2011. 2011 was when that 10,000 number for the minimum human population was, was first published. And uh, um, Forbes magazine had a piece on how, well, that's it for original sin. And a bunch of uh, Catholic philosophers responded uh, to that. And you can find that a, a good record of all the Catholic responses to this Forbes article on the web. Several Catholic philosophers, um, Edward Frieser, Michael Liccioni, different people responded to it um, with some really good thought. And um, 
Some of these Catholic philosophers are absolutely convinced that there's no problem here, that the exact words of Pius XII's encyclical and the Council of Trent are no problem for a human species that evolved with 10,000 or more individuals. I'll leave it to y'all, if you want to dig that deeply, to go and read these articles because they get very, very complicated. Um, and there are some different methods proposed by these Catholic philosophers for reconciling this. But people are working on it. It's not completely hopeless. Not completely hopeless. But it remains a problem. Polygenism, the evolutionary record, and original sin, I would say if there's a thorny nettle in the entire topic of evolution, this is it. So what do we do in such cases? Well, I think we can only do a few things. Number one, we can look at evidence. This is a 40,000-year-old cave painting. And that, I think, we can all agree, is the work of a rational mind, of a thinking human being. And it represents the real world symbolically. It requires thought. It requires imagination. It requires memory. It requires all of these stamps of humanity. It probably was not made by a Homo sapiens sapiens. A lot of these cave paintings are actually made by Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon people. It gets very, very complicated to understand who the first rational people were. And this Adam who fell, it gets very uncertain how much he looked like you and me. These are things we don't know. These are things we may never know. These are things that may remain mysterious for all the rest of human history. And so what do we do with that kind of stuff? Well, I'll let Pius XII close us out. God has placed man in the highest place in the scale of living creature, endowed as he is with a spiritual soul, the chief and the highest of all the animal kingdom. Manifold investigations in the fields of paleontology, biology, and morphology regarding other questions concerning the origin of man have thus far produced nothing clear and certain in a positive way. He's right about that. Therefore, we can only leave for the future the reply to the question whether someday science, illumined and guided by revelation, will offer certain and definite solutions to so serious a question. And that's what we can do for now. We can say, hmm, it's interesting. It's tantalizing. Who were the first people? When did they live? Where did they live? How did they fall? We don't know. We may never know. But we're Catholic. So we know that God created us, we know he guides his creation, and we know we're dependent on him. And if that makes sense, on that we'll end.